Vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K. Three of the vitamins we to look at in this video. Can you really get your vitamin D just from your sun exposure to your skin? Let's find out. Let's start off with vitamin D in this video. Now again, that means we're on the lipid soluble side of the vitamins. Vitamin D is actually a cluster of related structures. It's not just one thing. We're going to focus, though, on the biologically active forms of D2 and D3. Vitamin D2, also known as ergocalciferol, and vitamin D3, also known as calcitriol. I'll just refer to them as D2 and D3 just for simplicity purposes. When your body's trying to make vitamin D, you're actually synthesizing most of it, about 90% or so, in your skin if you have adequate sun exposure. I say if because there's a lot of factors that can impact the synthesis of vitamin D by your skin. The amount of sunlight is one of the big ones. If you live in an environment where you have winter and you're wrapped up cold, your arms and legs aren't exposed to the sun. You might just have a little bit of your face exposed and that's it. So that can mean you have to have more sunlight exposure time because there's so much little bit of skin actually being exposed. If your arms and legs are exposed, it's about 30 minutes on average is all you need. You can get that by simply walking in and out of the house, doing your normal chores and errands throughout the day. But there are things that can impact that time frame. I mentioned the amount of sunlight. So if you're having less skin exposed, you need more time for what is there. Also sunscreen, because the sun isn't reaching the skin as easily. Skin color can also impact that due to the pigmentation preventing the absorption of the sunlight. But if you can get that roughly 30 minutes of exposure, you produce about 90% of the vitamin D you need on a daily basis. But that's the key, daily basis. You can't just do this once in the week and then that's that. But that 30 minutes of exposure, if you have arms and legs exposed and without sunscreen, you're looking at about 250 micrograms of vitamin D being produced. That converts to about 10,000 IU units. So really that's plenty, except for the last 10% you get through your food. So there is still consumption in food or dietary supplements if necessary. A lot of times in winter, you might need extra supplementation because you just don't get the sun exposure if you live in a very northern or very far southern climate. Because the winter, just simply too cold, you're wrapped up, you don't get the skin, the actual exposure to the skin. So if you need to have it ingested, so focus more on the diet side of things. Vitamin D that you ingest is in an inactive form. So it's not active. You need to ingest this, absorb it, then it goes through your liver, liver sends the kidneys, and finally it's now an active form that you can use in your body. Now, why do we care? Well, vitamin D is important for several different reasons. First off, vitamin D helps with calcium homeostasis. And they're saying calcium, that's for your bones. Yeah, sure, calcium's bones and other things. But you need vitamin D in order to efficiently absorb calcium into your system. Without an adequate amount of vitamin D, you're lucky to absorb 15% of the calcium that you're ingesting, which means most of that calcium is simply going right through you. So vitamin D is necessary for calcium absorption of your GI tract. So what happens if you don't have enough vitamin D besides calcium problems? Well, that can impact the body in the case of children rickets or adults osteoporosis. Now, the case of a child, as they're developing, they're growing, their bones are getting longer, they're getting taller. 
Rickets is the case where the bones don't have enough calcium. Back to that homeostasis. So the bones themselves start to, instead of being straight, they bow. It's very pronounced in the legs and the pelvis, in the rib cage. So the bones themselves create these bowed legs, either out or bowing in. In adults, osteoporosis is looking at the density of the bones, how much calcium is actually in the actual adult bones. Not enough calcium means those bones become more brittle. They're easier to break and not as strong. So kind of important to keep that vitamin D level up. But some other reasons also to maintain vitamin D levels. Your immune system of functionality. Vitamin D can help with the strength of your immune system. Can help reduce the risk of autoimmune diseases. So it's important to get that vitamin D, sunlight, if not there, supplements, or diet. You can look at foods, things like fish, eggs, and poultry can give you vitamin D. Or fortified foods, things where vitamin D has been added into those foods, so when you consume them, you're getting vitamin D as well, even if they weren't naturally occurring in those foods. Things like orange juice, milk a lot of times, are vitamin D fortified. Well, I'm thinking, why those two? Because a lot of times those also have calcium in them, so calcium and vitamin D go hand in hand to aid in the calcium absorption. Vitamin D toxicity. Now, this typically doesn't happen unless you're taking a ton of supplements to really increase those vitamin D levels. So how much do you need? Starting off down at infancy, you're looking at about 10 micrograms of vitamin D per day. As you go through childhood into adults, looking at about 15 micrograms of vitamin D daily. Once you hit about 70 and older, they increase that up to 20 micrograms of vitamin D a day, just to help a little more calcium absorption in for the bones. All right, switching gears, vitamin E. Now, vitamin E is actually have eight different forms. But of those eight forms, we care about one. The other seven aren't gonna be relevant because they can't help our bodies. So the one form we're looking at is called alpha tocopherol. Now, this form of vitamin E helps protect your cell membrane from damage from free radicals. It can do this because it's an important antioxidant that's able to go into your cell membranes, but then once it's in the cell membrane, it can actually absorb the free radicals, taking them out of circulation, removing them from the possibility of damaging those lipids in the cell membrane. So it's helping to become the antioxidant to keep the cell membranes healthy and functional, which is quite important because you have to balance all the ions, balance all the nutrients entering and exiting your cells. But there's a catch. Vitamin E can only do this once each molecule. Once that vitamin E molecule absorbs a free radical, it's not useful anymore, which means you need to have a constant daily source of vitamin E coming in your body. So once it's done its task of being a free radical, time to clear it out, get rid of it. You need to ingest more vitamin E. But vitamin E is also important for T cell activity. This helps your immune system. Your T cells help to fight off foreign pathogens. It's been shown that supplementation of vitamin E in elderly patients can actually shorten the duration of an illness. There's been several research papers that have been showing this recently. So it can't stop the illness, but it can help strengthen the immune system to shorten the duration in elderly patients. So where do you get your vitamin E from? Nuts and seeds are probably the highest and best sources, but also is found in fish, tomatoes, spinach. So it really can have a lot of different places. So think about sunflower seeds for the nuts and seeds on it. Sunflower seeds, peanuts, great examples. So how about the recommended daily allowance? Looking at about four milligrams starting at infancy 
and going up through childhood to adults, looking at about 15 milligrams by adulthood. So it kind of keeps increasing there a little bit. And that's again on a daily basis. All right, moving into vitamin K. This is the last of our lipid silo vitamins to talk about. Vitamin K again is also a series of different structures. You have K1, K2, and K3. K1 is plant-based. K2 is animal-based. That means us, so we're storing K2. K3 is mostly synthesized by your liver. So if we're looking at K2, so vitamin K2, it actually has several different variants that we'll find in our bodies. The variants are all based on the length of the chain that makes up K2. But overall, these variants and the overall K2 as a whole really is the main storage we find in our bodies. So we store some vitamin K. Vitamin K is gonna help you with your blood clotting. So you get a cut, you're bleeding. If you don't have vitamin K, that bleeding just keeps going and going. Because vitamin K is a necessity for a prothrombin to work. Now, prothrombin is part of a cascade, a series of reactions that eventually lead to fibrin. Fibrin is what helps to form the actual clot. So the precursor to fibrin, you have to go backwards, a couple steps, but that's prothrombin. So without vitamin K, you can't activate that properly, which means you can't eventually get to fibrin, which is that whole cascade. Second benefit, bone remodeling. Now your bones, they're constantly remodeling your entire life. They're adjusting to stress and strain. They're moving cells here and there, adding calcium, subtracting calcium. This is all helped by the function of vitamin K because osteocalcin needs vitamin K to function. And without osteocalcin, you can't remodel your bones efficiently. So where do you get vitamin K? Vitamin K comes from your green vegetables. Things like broccoli, spinach, asparagus are great sources. Also, you can find it in dairy as well. So how much do you need? Infancy, you start off at two micrograms and head up through adulthood, you're looking into about 120 or 90 micrograms. They have different recommendations, male versus female. 120 male, 90 female. So three of the lipid soluble vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K. Until the next video.